Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who has already received four letters from his HOA about his Halloween decorations. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. Too many pumpkins. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. It's the second half of October, my friends, and we are in the mood for some dark and scary good beer. So this week we are featuring an old favorite for real beer lovers. How about some dragon's milk from the brilliant women and men brewing up liquid black magic at New Holland Brewing? This is a bourbon barrel aged imperial double stout. That means it's dark, delicious, and powerful, baby. ABV 11% garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. And here's some cheers and thank yous to our friends for helping us out with this week's beer run. First up, a big shout out to my friend Walker down in Knoxville, Tennessee. And a big we like your jib to Manny and the Major and Wes Friendship, Maryland. That's right. Thank you all for helping us out with this week's beer run. If you want to help us out with next week's beer run, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Always love to give the dragon's milk out as a gift. It's a tasty treat and powerful stuff. B double E double R U N beer run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, make sure you go to our website, sign up for off the record over 160 episodes if you're not listening then you are nasty and that's enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime True crime stories about the Manson family, the Jonestown Massacre, and Waco, Texas have fascinated Americans for decades. The fascination of these real-life tragedies and crimes is so strong that each year someone new turns out a new version of each of these old news stories, complete with new details and never-before-seen footage. Recently, documentaries and fictionalized streaming shows continue to see much success with titles like The Vow, Wild Wild Country, and Devil in Ohio. The masses are reading, watching, and listening because we want to know more. We want to know how it all works. What are the beliefs and the rules of a cult? We want to learn about the cult's leaders, followers, and their enemies should they have any. How do they recruit, and why or what turns a small number of these groups toward violence? Defining cults and deciding which groups should be labeled as such is sometimes a difficult task because of the variety of groups that exist outside of the mainstream. The Will to Kill, a 2001 book by James A. Fox and Jack Levin, defined the results as being loosely structured in unconventional forms of small religious groups, the members of which are held together by a charismatic leader who mobilizes their loyalty around some new religious cause, typically a cause that is at odds with that of more conventional religious institutions. In other words, many cults are small groups of seemingly like-minded individuals who are taught, teach, and practice their beliefs or religion which in most cases is a loosely structured version of a more widespread and regularly practiced religion. Some of the largest religious groups are Christians, Muslims, and in some parts of the world, Jews. In spite of the many differences of these religions, they share a fundamental belief in a God as compassionate and just. As a result, those communities have nurtured people of extraordinary kindness from the Bible, 
Matthew 5. The good book teaches us that Jesus also set very high ethical standards for his followers, including an unbounded willingness to forgive wrongdoing, non-retaliation against evil, and love of enemies. Yet some of the most appalling atrocities in history have been rooted in religion. Religious violence can take on a particularly intense and ruthless character if the objects of that violence are seen as blasphemy or enemies of God or God's way narrowly conceived. In the case of what we have here today, it's ruthless violence dulled out judge, jury, and executioner style by the cult's leader upon some of his followers. God and religion do ask of us and try to teach us to live our lives out practicing high ethical standards. God wants us to possess an unbounded willingness to forgive wrongdoing, to not retaliate against evil, and to love our enemies. If we truly believed and followed these teachings, well, we would not commit acts of violence against one another. We would not kill, and there should never be a killing in the name of God. This is is a Kirtland cult killings. And this is True Crime Garage. December 31st, 1989, a tip was called into the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. It was relayed to the chief of police in Kirtland, Ohio, because the tip was related to his jurisdiction. The caller said that a family was missing, and some bodies were buried in a barn on a property of a rented farmhouse. This is located at 8671 Euclid Chardon Road, this would be one and a half miles east out of town. Authorities proceeded to the property in question. Upon arrival here, Captain, so far so good, because when they get to the property, they can in fact see that a barn is on the premises. So there may be some truth to this tip that they received. Right. Police found the property deserted with evidence that the residents had left in a hurry. But of course, what the police really needed to search based on the tipster's information was that barn on the property. You could just feel the search becoming more intense if you're law enforcement. In the barn, they found some personal possessions of presumably this missing family. This included some drawings in notebooks that clearly belonged to children. They decided that they are going to need to do a little excavating in the barn to see if they could find what it was that they were looking for. But also keep in mind, they're out there looking for what was called in on their tip, but you're also, I would guess you're also hoping to not find what was called in on the tip. Exactly. So on January 3rd, 1990, they started digging. Dan Dunlap was a lieutenant in the Lake County Sheriff's Office at the time. He was a patrol officer on the day the Kirtland Police Chief Dennis Yarbrough requested assistance from the Sheriff's Office and the Lake County Crime Lab in processing the crime scene, a.k.a. the barn. Officer Dunlap told the News Herald, The place was damp, cold, dark, and full of trash and rubble. So there was a lot of clearing going on. He said they found bodies beneath layers of soil, rocks, and garbage in the rear portion of the barn's lower level. This would be a difficult day to be law enforcement. They found the first body buried about four feet deep. After that, they stopped and obtained search warrants for the whole place. Additional digging 
the next day revealed not one, not two, not three, but sadly four additional corpses, all in the same burial pit. Three of them were children. The caller that phoned in the tip predicted that five bodies would be found, all members of one single family. And the caller, turns out he was right. The fire chief that was present that day told the News Herald that they, meaning the bodies, they had rocks on top of them and they were back filled with clay. So somebody took a considerable amount of effort to bury and attempt to conceal these bodies. Now, none of these bodies were identified right away, Captain. The, the bodies were very badly decomposed. In fact, if the tipster was right, they had been there and they had been buried there for nearly a year by the time that they were unearthed. But the caller did tell authorities who they would find buried in that barn. So the identification of the bodies was not so much a mystery. It really, at this point in our timeline, just needed to be confirmed. Yeah, the caller is telling you the truth or seems to be telling you the truth. There's no reason not to believe them now. Yes, in fact, the, the caller was right and you are right there, Captain. The bodies, once the bodies were identified, we would learn that the five bodies were that of five members of the Avery family. This is Dennis Avery, age 48, and his wife, Cheryl, age 41. And then the three children were their three daughters, Trina, Rebecca, and little Karen. And their ages, respectively, are 15, 13, and 7. Each victim was found to have been bound. They were executed and then dumped in the hole in the ground inside this barn. All of them had been shot with a 45 caliber gun. Do we have any autopsy information from law enforcement? We do get some brief autopsy report information that makes its way to the newspapers. And it's as follows. The autopsies on the five members of the Avery family revealed the following. Dennis, the father, was shot twice in the chest. Cheryl was shot three times in the chest. Trina was shot in the head and chest. Rebecca was shot once in the back and once in the left side. And then Karen, the youngest member of the family, was shot once in the head and once in the chest. The coroner found silver duct tape wrapped around the victim's heads, feet, and hands. So in short, this was the murder of an entire family of five. Now, no gun was found in the pit with the bodies. Every one of the victims were found bound with tape, as we just described. So this family, as it appears from the start of this investigation and based off of these reports, this family was executed and then buried in this barn. Now we need to introduce Dale Luffman. Dale was a reverend and the leader in the Kirtland branch of the Reformed Latter-day Saints. And I might say... RLDS at times. If I do, Captain, I'm referring to Reformed Latter day Saints. When the five bodies of the Avery family were found, he was one of the first people to come forward to talk to police about what he knew about this situation, which in the case of Dale Luffman turned out to be a whole heck of a lot. This eager cooperation on his part was likely an attempt by Luffman to separate his organization, the Reformed Latter-day Saints, from this whole murder scandal, this murder of a family of five. He told the Dayton Daily News that the five-acre Kirtland area farm, this is the property where the bodies were found, had been leased by a man who was formerly a member of the Reformed Latter-day Saints organization in Kirtland, Ohio. The man he was talking about was a lay minister, what's referred to as a lay minister, who was defrocked by the Reformed Latter-day Saints because, quote, he was silenced for ethical reasons. He would have been expelled from the church on the basis of unchristian conduct 
had he not withdrawn his membership. Well, if you're not going to act like a Christian, you're going to get defrocked. He's saying that this man then later formed a radical splinter group of his own because this man had been kicked out of the reformed Latter-day Saints. He essentially formed his own cult, a, a spinoff, a splinter group of, of the original group. But if you're law enforcement and you find a burial ground in this barn, the, the first thing you're going to look for is who is the owner who is operating this property. Correct. And that makes sense with what this man is telling police for many reasons. Okay. First off, police had some general idea that something not so great was going on on that property with a, with a, a considerable group of people. And they were already aware of this man that is being described to them. They were aware of this, let's say air quotes for now, cult that was operating on this property. And as you pointed out, Captain, and what this man is telling police, confirming what they likely already knew, was that this man that he was talking about was leasing this 15 acres, this property, and he was leasing the barn in which they found the five bodies. So the man that he was talking about is a, is a man named Jeffrey Lundgren. So Jeffrey Lundgren had been kicked out of the reformed Latter-day Saints and essentially formed his own little cult in which he was viewed as the supreme leader and his followers did his bidding. Luffman went on to desperately try to delineate his own religious organization from this splinter group from this criminal one. The way all this went down from my understanding here, Captain, is that Jeffrey Lundgren, once he was pushed out or decided to leave the reformed Latter-day Saints, he moved to the farm with some of his devotees and then ran this commune of sorts on its grounds. Up until April of 1989, when he and his family and some of his followers decided to split town whereabouts unknown. Luffman told investigators he was certain Lundgren was behind the killings. So what we have going on here at this time, right? Is murder and defrocking. We have bodies that, according to the tipster, have been in this barn for almost a year, several months. And what we know so far is that when police get there, they recover the bodies, the, the family of five, from this burial inside of the barn, they're learning a, a couple of things. Lundgren, who leased the place, had these followers. He split town. We don't know where he and some of the followers are. And now we're being told months later that Jeffrey Lundgren is the one that is behind the killings of these five people that we just found. Well, and on top of that, he did something bad within the church or bad enough where the church didn't want to have him be a part of it. Yes. And this is where the story gets a little complicated because we have to try to, well, there's a family of five buried in a barn. It's already complicated. Try to understand the, this religion. And then even more so what's more important is to try to understand this little faction, this little splinter group of, of this religion. So, and I don't want a bunch of emails if I get this wrong, because look, I'm not well versed on my own religion, let alone everybody else's. So Kirtland, Ohio, established by the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints, a Christian-based religion that follows the tenets of Joseph Smith, as some believe he was a prophet of Jesus. The Latter-day Saints Church is otherwise known as the Mormon Church. It was founded by Smith in the 1820s. He wrote the Book of Mormon in 1830. So Joseph Smith settled in Kirtland, Ohio in 1831 and established the town as the base of his burgeoning sect. In 1836, he built a temple that was to be a beacon, or not to be, it was a beacon to the members of the church everywhere. So members of this church and of this religion, they're flocking to Kirtland, Ohio back in the early 1800s because he built 
this temple. If you build it, they will come. Well, he built it, and yes, they did come. Smith dies in 1844. He was killed by a mob in Illinois, and this is when the church that he established splintered. So Brigham Young led some of the members to Utah and founded what is known today as the modern church of the Latter-day Saints. The church members who stayed in Kirtland, Ohio, transformed their offshoot of the Latter-day Saints Church into the Reformed Latter-day Saints Church. This was formed in 1852 in the wake of Smith's death and the splintering of the church he established. The Reformed Latter-day Saints was headquartered in Independence, Missouri. Okay, so... Are, I, are we all on the same page here, roughly? Yeah, the best way to explain this is you have a pizza shop, and it's called Ray's. And then some people worked at Ray's Pizza Shop, and they wanted to start their own pizza shop. So they started another one called Original Ray's. After Ray passes away. Right. And then those people decide to start another pizza shop and call it Famous Ray's. So it's all Ray's Pizza, but it's just kind of... A little bit different versions. Yeah. The devil is in the, the details. The, 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 or, or here in this case, maybe not the devil, but but uh, something is in the details. And, and you're right, Captain. The, the the crust may be a little different. The cheese might be a different blend. the The pepperoni right. used is ordered from someplace else. But but it's it's generally, from my understanding, again, this is just some garage guy's understanding of something that's much larger than him. It's at the at the center of it all. It's all very much the same, and it all kind of comes from the same place. Well, it sounds like Jeffrey started a division of Shady Rays. Pizza. Yes, that's that's exactly right. Well, and we're we're going to find out exactly why here as we continue on looking into some of these different characters here. Now, the Dead Family, the Averys. They were members of the Reformed Latter-day Saints in Kirtland, Ohio, but they were part of a small group of people that left the church to join yet another offshoot, one that was not sanctioned by the church establishment, this being Jeffrey Lundgren's offshoot of the Reformed Latter-day Saints. Well, Luffman wasn't the only one that wanted to talk to law enforcement after these bodies were found. Yeah. Others had a lot to say as well. And a lot to say about Jeffrey Lundgren police heard one name over and over again from people who were familiar with the cult and the outcast from the reformed Latter-day Saints, the name that kept coming up Lundgren, 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 this from the Akron beacon journal. On January 6th, 1990, which says Lundgren, who police say headed a militant and a very secretive religious cult calling itself the family was being sought late Friday. So this is the Akron Beacon Journal reporting that police have talked to a lot of people and we we know who we are looking for. Um, we're, we are actively looking for a man named Jeffrey Lundgren. Because we believe either A, he knows intimate details about the killing of this family, or he was the person responsible. With all these people so willing to talk, it was really easy for police to start rounding up suspects. Unfortunately, Jeffrey Lundgren was not one of those that they were able to round up so easily. He was missing in action. But other members of his cult were living in Kansas City. On January 5th, This is really just hours after the bodies were uncovered. A Lake County grand jury quickly indicted 13 people, seven of whom were already in custody in Kansas City. According to the Akron Beacon Journal, the 13 were, quote, accused of plotting the ritual slayings following Lundgren's religious tenets. Arrest warrants for all 13 people were issued. One person was deemed to be the trigger man. The rest, the other 12, were decided it was they were all accomplices to this mass murder. But still no sign of Jeff Lundgren. That's right. And police were really trying to get a handle on what actually happened here. 
Uh, there were stories about Jeffrey Lundgren's involvement. We know that, but they needed to figure out were those stories in fact true? And if so, how did a separatist religious leader turn into some kind of cold blooded killer of children and their parents? Right. Kirkland police chief Dennis Yarbrough told the Dayton daily news on January 5th, that the leader of the group, Jeffrey Lundgren appeared to be forcing or persuading the other members to sign all properties and checks their, their money checks over to him personally. And from what they were being told, the murder of this family of the Avery family was not the act of one person. Instead, it was done in a ceremonial way with multiple witnesses slash participants supporting the executions. Right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Cheers. The the captain has been inspired to to start his own religion right out of our little garage here. He's we're gonna call it original rays. Original rays, and he's already got me. I'm fully enrolled. I'm signing over my paycheck to the captain as we speak. Should I make it to cash? Well, just to be clear. <laughs> Just to be clear, what we have here is we have a religious group. Some of the members create an offshoot. Some of those members from the offshoot then are killed. And this is all witnessed or participated by the members of the offshoot. Mm -hmm. And their leader is Jeffrey Lundgren. So, all right, let's take a look at who this guy is. and. How did he become the leader of this corrupt organization, a cult leader, now all entangled up in murder and murder charges? Jeffrey Lundgren was born in 1950 in Independence, Missouri. Now, keep in mind, you're going to notice throughout the telling of this true crime story that you will hear several cities that are repeated throughout the course of the telling of this true crime story. One of them, you've already noticed, is Independence, Missouri. Lundgren was raised in the Reformed Latter-day Saints Church, which is based in his hometown, Independence, Missouri. Court documents indicate that as a youth, Lundgren was mostly a loner, but was active in sports and church activities. His father was a strict disciplinarian, and it's reported that his father may have even enjoyed teasing and punishing a young Jeffrey. Yeah, some would say abusive. Jeffrey Lundgren attended Central Missouri State University, where he met his future wife, Alice, who was also a church member. But Lundgren was not academically inclined, and he never did very well in in school. He married Alice in 1980. He joined the Navy and was sent to Vietnam. After he completed his tour of duty and was honorably discharged, he held some short-term jobs like hospital maintenance worker, but he really struggled to keep a position. Finally, he and Alice moved to Kirtland, Ohio in 1984, this with their two kids, and then they would go on to have two more children. The move was motivated by... Jeffrey Lundgren's affinity for the Reformed Latter-day Saints Church and the historic and iconic temple, remember the one that was built by the church founder more than a century earlier, in this small town. This is a small town in Ohio, population roughly about 6,000 people. He worked as a senior church tour guide for the Kirtland Temple Historic Center. This is considered to be, before he shamed it, obviously, this was considered to be an honored volunteer position where he led tours through the temple, discussing its history, 
and sacred role within the Reformed Latter-day Saints Church. As a perk of being a guide, for which he had to be very well versed in the church's teachings, the Lundgren family got to live in an apartment which was owned by the church. They got to live there rent-free. All of this was fine at first for a period of time. Church devotees admitted Lundgren into the fold and began to look up to him because he had like a legendary grasp of scripture and was able to recite passages from memory. As Luffman, who we've brought up several times, described to the Beacon Journal, said, quote, he could quote scripture, not always accurately, in a rapid fire style that some people found impressive, end quote. Indeed, Jeffrey Lundgren was effective at drawing people to the faith and recruiting them to the Reformed Latter-day Saints Church. He would take trips back to his home state of Missouri and attend meetings at his old church, this to find recruits. Apparently, Captain, he had an uncanny ability to prey on people who were vulnerable, manipulable. To be a douche canoe. Looking for change, seeking guidance. So he was good at recruiting, regardless of the methods he was using. Several people described him as a spiritual bully. Uh, he promised a warm, supportive, loving, and strong church community in Kirtland, Ohio. And people actually moved there to join up with that legit church at the time of the Reformed Latter-day Saints. Well, obviously, it becomes a destination for somebody that, especially somebody like Jeffrey, he's raised in the church. This is basically their holy land. And so when he has no job, he has no opportunities, he probably thought, well, this is a good destination, one, because of my faith, but because of this sacred land. Luffman said the first problem started back in 1986. This is when Lundgren was sort of going off script, starting to enjoy the spotlight as a tour guide, espousing ideas that were increasingly radical. So he's supposed to be leading these tours and teaching all these people who could either be recruited into the religion or are already a part of the religion because they want to visit the sacred ground, as you pointed out. But he's giving these tours, and now he's starting to like go off script, and he's throwing in his own ideas and and maybe things that the the church are not telling him to say or not don't and, and don't want him to be saying during the course of these tours. I'd like to be the fly on the wall during one of those tours. For example, we have some examples here. For example, Lundgren would tell people that he had a special power to determine what was true in the Bible and what wasn't. So. That's 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 interesting to learn while you're on your tour. That the tour guide has a power to be able to discern what is true and untrue in the Bible. He emphasized that he had a connection to God. Again, let's go back to Luffman's words here. A lot of what we know about Lundgren comes from this Luffman character. Luffman says, "Quote: People were complaining that he." meaning Jeffrey Lundgren, was misrepresenting the teachings of the church during the tours he guided. He was increasingly putting his own spin on doctrine, and many patrons were very upset. But Lundgren wasn't just a tour guide who was speaking out of turn. By this point in our timeline, he is a lay minister. So this is somebody who would be permitted to counsel parishioners, even in their homes, and to preach at some actual church services. So he's not just a tour guide anymore who's spouting off his own ideas. He's now a person that is looked up to. He's a lay minister. He's on these tours, and he's starting to push his own agenda. Not only push his own agenda, but to promote himself as a man with special powers. Yes. So he's Lundgren's preaching about like the hidden meetings, that he was able to glean from the Bible based on his, you know, the, his method of, of scripture interpretation that he was able to determine what was true and what wasn't true. And then he was also doing stuff that was reading text for reoccurring. So, so he says that he was able to find within the Bible 
uh, text that had reoccurring patterns that contained messages. And he was able to see what these messages are and he's able to deliver them to, to people like me and you, the regular Joes, right? This is from a much later report that came out that states, quote, Lundgren generally fit within the traditions of the reformed Latter-day Saints faith in that he described visions, direct spiritual experiences, and God speaking directly to prophets. But Lundgren went far outside of the bounds of prophecy. So he claimed to possess special powers. Um, and I have a list of some of his his special powers if you would like to hear how powerful this Jeffrey Lundgren actually was. I can't freaking wait. He had the ability to predict future events. Well, that comes in handy. Yes. He claimed to have the ability to sense the presence of people and events which are at a geographical remove from where he is. He had the ability to trigger natural events such as earth tremors. He reportedly told his followers that he was present when Jesus Christ was crucified and that in other ways as well, he was able to transcend the restrictions of time. Well, no wonder he looked so freaking old. He claims to have experienced multiple visions where he is shown his special mission or missions on earth. This, I can't help it, Captain, but this reminds me of maybe one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time, depending on who you ask. Tenacious D, that wonderful song they had, Wonder Boy, where Jack Black describes for Rage Cage and the rest of us his secret powers and the secret of his powers. Wonder Boy. The Reformed Latter-day Saints church leaders noticed that the historic center was missing some money as well. So he's not just telling all these people all of his wonderful ideas on through the course of his tours, but money is coming up missing as well. So the Kirk, well, that wasn't one, one of his superpowers was not personal finances or the ability to hide his, his thiefdom from the, uh, <laughs> from the people right. in power. So the Kirtland state president, Dale Luffman says Lundgren was let go for ethical and moral issues that are critically important to us, to their religion and to that, to the church later, it revealed that the temple officials accused Jeffrey Lundgren of stealing between 25,000 up to maybe $40,000 from the temple coffers. That's a whole lot of rolling papers, especially in the late eighties. That's a ton of rolling papers. Mm -hmm. And in this economy with inflation, I mean, come on, mm. maybe not so many rolling papers with inflation now. Mm. As a result of his radicalism and him being accused or the belief that he was stealing from the church, Jeffrey Lundgren, of course, lost his position as the temple tour guide. This in October of 1987. And as a result of that, he lost his free living arrangements for him and his family. So Jeffrey Lundgren and the Lundgren family, they gonna have to move. So they ended up renting the 15 acre farm that we've talked about where the bodies were found just outside of town on that Euclid Chardon road. And that's going to cost money, right? Lundgren's now going to have to pay for his living arrangements and for this farm where he moved his family to. So Jeffrey Lundgren basically does a Jerry Maguire, right? He's getting kicked out and he, he does the old, uh, you know, who's coming with me situation. You had me at hello. So he encouraged the defection of his, of the people that, that believed him. Like he's giving these tours and he has people with inside the church that, that he's spouting off his radical ideas to and, and bragging about his so-called powers to, and people within the church are believing him. And so he, even, you know, before he's asked to leave the church, he has followers and he encouraged, probably demanded the defection of his quote, loyal followers from the reformed Latter-day Saints church. 
asking them to move with him to the commune that he was putting together that he was establishing on this farm that he's now renting about 20 people formally resigned from the reform Latter-day Saints church and moved in with the Lundgrens. They were reportedly attracted by his fiery preachings and seemingly insider knowledge of scripture. Meanwhile, according to Luffman, Lundgren was then defrocked by the RLDS church. Not only were his ministerial privileges revoked, but he was excommunicated. So you can see where this is going, right, Captain? Jeffrey Lundgren was kicked out of the church where he enjoyed being some kind of big shot. So he established his own cult with himself as the leader. And then we have his followers. Now at this point, they're referring to him as some kind of prophet. They, they called him dad. Never a good sign to follow somebody that is one kicked out of the church, but two is not saying, call me Jeff or call me Mr. Lundgren. They're saying, Hey, call me dad or father. Not good signs. It was reported that people that left the RLDS, they followed him because they were dumbasses. Liked his group better because it was considered to be a much more conservative group than the traditional Reformed Latter day Saints. <laughs> the Reformed Latter day Saints is LGBTQ friendly and also allows women to become church leaders. This is in contradiction of that of the Latter-day Saints church's teachings, that women should be subservient to men. So Jeffrey Lundgren started becoming increasingly radical with his new little group of followers. He starts doing things like predicting the return of Christ to earth and the destruction of everything except the temple and the devoted followers of Jeffrey Lundgren's preachings. In other words, if you didn't follow the path that he established, you were doomed. I am not following this douche canoe with a horrible mullet. He promised to bring his followers to Zion, where they would witness the return of Christ. He started to dictate the lives of everyone in the commune. And he started to control everything in their lives as well. Well, this probably stems from, like we said before, Lundgren, when he was back in Missouri, wasn't doing so well as far as making ends meet. Now he goes, moves to Ohio, starts telling a couple fibs, all of a sudden feels like he's getting some kind of power and money's coming in. And when they try to separate him from the church, well, if I take some followers with me, then maybe I can con them into my system. And I think a lot of this was just because he just didn't didn't like his life, didn't like the way things turned out, felt like a failure. And now these people make me feel good. They think I'm something special. I tell them I'm something special. They believe me and rinse and repeat. Captain, I think that you're probably right here. The, the thing that I would say that, also could be the situation would be that look for these people to follow him. They clearly had blinders on, but is there a chance that Jeffrey Lundgren had blinders on himself? Like, did he become so disillusional or so delusional that he started to believe these things himself or to start to think that he was something that he was not right. Or also just that he felt like he had the power to, convince them to con them. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of people out there too, that even if they are doing wrong or if they are lying to others, they have the belief that if, well, if as long as what I'm doing is for the greater good, then it doesn't matter how I get there. Sounds like some of the popular true crime podcasts out there, right? It doesn't matter how we get there or how I get the followers or get people to join me. And that could be the situation as well that he, he believed that he was trying to do good. It's it's really difficult for us to try to crawl inside the brain and the and figure out this this character. Now, 
going back to his little followers, his little group of followers or his sheep, as I will refer to them as at some point, according to like we talked about him trying to and starting to dictate their lives and to control them and control everything going on on this piece of property here, this 15 acres. Wikipedia, which is not my favorite source to go to, but they, you know, sometimes they give you the good, short, and sweet version of things. And here on Wikipedia, they say, for example, to show his his control that cult members were forbidden to talk amongst themselves. Doing so was determined to be a sin. And he even came up with a term for it. He called it murmuring. So all, if we were his followers, we were forbidden to talk amongst ourselves, to conduct and, and, well, there goes the podcast. and be a part of this murmuring, and, and it would be considered a sin. There's also reports that he, that Jeffrey Lundgren would find ways to eavesdrop on the cult members. So he's listening into their conversations and such when they are talking amongst themselves And they're unaware of this. And later he's using the information that he gets from, from listening in on their conversations to get them to believe that he could read their minds. Right. Like I said, another way to con them into believing that he has these powers. It it was all just trickery really. And a lot of it too. And we see this in, unfortunately we see this in, Um, bad domestic situations or controlling boyfriend situations. Uh, A lot of these types of behaviors, right? We see time and time again in these different cases that we cover and they all are very different cases, but it's interesting to see similar behaviors by the controlling individual, right? So in this situation, we have Jeffrey Lundgren who starts to, I mean, he actually managed to isolate his sheep from, from almost from the rest of the world entirely, not completely, but almost right. He's got these people living with him on his commune on this 15 acres of land in Kirtland, Ohio, just outside of town. And he, he's convinced them to contribute their worldly possessions and their paychecks to the greater good, which was him. His followers, they work their day jobs, that, but they turn their checks over to him. Well, a lot of these religions, when you go to mass on Sunday or maybe Saturday night or whenever you choose to go, you you don't have to, but they appreciate an offering. And a lot of times these offerings are 15% of what you are bringing in, which is can be pretty high for some individuals and family. But this guy is saying, no, not 15%. I need it all. And he probably was telling them, hey, we're just getting started. So we need as much as possible so we can build as quick as possible. Well, and they would work the, the followers that he allowed to work. They're basically working their day jobs most days long days and then turning over their paychecks to him uh, that that is used for things like taking care of everybody in the group but but primarily taking care of him and his actual biological family and in his you know marital family well he is the prophet but then after they're done working for the day at their jobs they're required to gather in these submissive nightly scripture meetings to hear Jeffrey Lundgren just preach and preach and preach about his interpretation of scripture. All of this going on on the farm every evening at night. And this is all really designed to continue to keep him in power, to remind his flock that they needed his leadership or they were lost. want to thank everybody for listening. Join us here in the garage. So much more case to get to. 
Make sure you're following us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube at True Crime Garage. And until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't litter. 